without further ado, I'd now like you to join me in welcoming Tony Sieber. Tonight, I want to tell you about the clean disruption of transportation. Um, but before I tell you about the future, um, I want to tell you about the past, um, because there's something to be learned about the past. Can you all see the picture okay? Um, can anyone tell me where the car is in this picture? Anyone? Where is the car? That's New York City, 1900. There is one car. Let me take you to same place, same time, 1913. Where is the horse? This is disruption. And when disruption happens, it happens very, very quickly. Um, Anyone who has used digital cameras can tell me what they were using 12 years ago. Was anyone using digital cameras 12 years ago? What about Android or uh, iPhone? No, no one, no one? That's disruption for you. When disruption happens, it happens very quickly. Um, so today's agenda, I wanna tell you about technologies, disruptive technologies that are going to change everything having to do with private and public transportation. Um, and I wanna start with the electric vehicle. Um, some of you may have heard that the Tesla Model S um, out of Silicon Valley was named the car of the year, 2013. Not the electric car of the year, it was the car of the year. Consumer Reports said it's the best car ever that they have tested, ever. Not EV, the best car ever. Um, and in the US, it's already the best selling luxury car in America. That's an electric vehicle. Now, minor detail, who can afford an electric vehicle? Now, that's not my car. I actually, <laughs> I actually don't own a car. Um, and I'll tell you about it uh, uh, tonight. But first, let's talk about disruption because it, it, it's a word that can be abused. Um, what does it mean? Here's what it means. Um, a disruptive product, usually technology, helps to create a new market. And in doing so, it basically significantly weakens, transforms, or even destroys an existing uh, product category. So you can look at the, uh, the examples, digital photography versus film, um, so MP3 players versus CDs, and so on and so forth. Um, now, here's the interesting thing about disruptive products. Initially, they're usually dismissed. They're dismissed as inadequate, they're dismissed as you know, low quality, they're dismissed as not good enough, or even toys. Um, and, uh, but it's usually a matter of time be before they improve and they get so much better that they destroy the existing competition. Um, and it's usually the experts and the insiders who dismiss disruptive products. I mean, I can show you 200 uh, of these quotes from mainstream experts, industry experts and insiders, who said, nah, not good enough. Cell phone, not good enough, too expensive. Um, uh, you don't get cell phone reception everywhere. It's intermittent. Now, if you substitute cell phone for solar, for instance, same thing, right? So I keep hearing the same comments and I'm like, it's on to something. Um, so let's go back to horses and cars. Um, it was just a matter of time before cars disrupted horses. There was nothing that the carriage industry or the horse industry could do about it. And that's what this product, this disrupt, disruptive products do. Um, so question, is the electric vehicle disruptive? I'm gonna give you five reasons 
I can give you nine. I'm just uh, <laughs> not going to give all of them. Um, number one, the electric motor is four or five times more energy efficient than the internal combustion engine. So your car um, only turns about 80% of the energy in gasoline into kinetic, uh, into movement. Just about, I mean, 20%. 80% is literally wasted, up in the air, okay? On the other hand, the electric motor flips that. Um, it uses just about 90% of the energy, and it may waste 5 or 10%. Because of this, and because transporting gasoline, imagine drilling somewhere in Saudi Arabia, refining it, putting it on a ship, bring it here, and all that costs a lot of money, right? Electricity is easier, you develop it, and within a microsecond, you have it at home. Because of this combination, an electric vehicle is 10 times, at least, cheaper to charge on a per mile basis than a gasoline car, 10 times. Anytime you have a 10x improvement in, a, in, a, in an important dimension, you may have a disruptive product. Three, the EV is 10x cheaper to maintain. The electric motor lasts for decades. And because it has fewer parts, uh, fewer parts will break. So um, it's cheaper to uh, charge, it's cheaper to maintain. Um, wireless charging. Um, so basically, if you have a bus, you can have the infrastructure so that every time it stops, it's going to charge. Try that with, with a gasoline vehicle, right? Um, and, and this is one of the most important things. The electric vehicle is so much more powerful, so much more powerful than the internal combustion engine, that it actually shifts the price performance um, equation of the... Um, uh, automotive industry. So Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, and I'm giving Tesla as an example um, of EVs tonight, uh, said that their next SUV, which will cost about $40,000 US, will have the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera. Wow, right? So for a hundred years, this is what the industry has given us. You want Low performance, you pay low price. You want high performance, you pay higher price. You want the Porsche, 100K. You want the uh, Enclave, 40K, right? Now, electric vehicles do this. It totally shifts the equation. Now you can get an SUV for the same price as an Enclave, but with the same performance as the Porsche. It totally, totally disrupts the industry, and this alone will basically change the whole equation. Um, so, okay, so it is disruptive. How long will the transition take? And, and, and I've done the numbers. Um, in my opinion, we'll need 200 miles minimum as a range for mainstream EVs. If you do those numbers, then you'll come up with, today 200 miles will cost $25,000 for the battery alone, and therefore the EV will cost $75,000. It's still a little pricey, um, but um, one of the things that I do in my work is look at the exponential cost improvements in technology. So the lithium ion battery has been going down about 14% per year for about 15 or 20 years. But in fact, since 2010, it's been going down 16% per year. And that's because there used to be three industries, three multi-trillion dollar industries that invested. Uh, there used to be one, uh, electronics, basically your laptops and your iPhone, that invested in lithium ion batteries. Now we have three, energy, automotive, and electronics. So triple the investment, triple the market, the, the uh, technology is going down 
improving much more quickly and going down in cost that much more quickly. Um, as an example, you may have heard that Tesla is going to open a $5 billion battery factory. $5 billion. Now this one factory in and of itself is going to double the lithium ion production in the world. Just one factory. Just the fact that it's gonna be built, it's going to cut costs by 30%, not including breakthroughs. That's even better, right? So let's do the numbers. Uh, lithium ion batteries are going down by 16%. What's that gonna do to the cost of EVs? Okay, so by 2018, the industry will be able to build a 200 mile electric vehicle um, that's gonna have the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera, by the way, because electric motors are so much more powerful, um, for 40 grand. So no gasoline vehicle equivalent to a $40,000 EV will be able to compete with it. And I'm talking 2018, not 2080, 2018. Keep going down the cost curve. And by 2020, the industry will be able to produce a $31,000 electric vehicle um, that goes 200 miles. And did I mention has the performance of a Porsche 911 car? Okay, okay. I'm, I, I, I don't know if I forgot. Now, by 2022, the industry will be able to produce a $21,000 EV that goes 200 miles and has the performance of, okay. Um, so basically, after 2022, it'll be able to compete with the Kias, and the, and, the, and the Porsches and the GMs and basically any car produced out there, 2022. Now, even if I'm a little bit optimistic, which I'm not, um, and we say 2025, basically by 2025, the gasoline car industry will not be able to compete with EVs, period. That's 11 years from now, okay? so. Conclusions from um, electric vehicles. One, the mass migration from gasoline vehicles to EVs is gonna start around 2017, 2018. Two, all new cars will be electric by 2030, maybe before, like I said. All new cars will be electric by 2030 and oil will be obsolete because all new cars are gonna be electric by 2030. 30. Okay, let me talk about the mobile internet. Now, this is actually my phone, what I'm showing. Uh, did I say I don't own a car? I don't own a car. I do everything using this, my iPhone app, um, and I'll, I'll talk about it. So if I wanna get on the bus, there's an app for that. I know exactly when it's coming and where it's taking me and when I'm gonna get there. If I want to get on the train, there's an app for that. Um, car sharing, ride sharing, I don't take taxis anymore, I do ride sharing. It's all in there. My whole public and, tra and private transportation is here. I wanna talk about a couple of things though. Car sharing, um, there's a company called Zipcar that basically has on-demand individual transportation. So anytime that I need a car, I just you know go on the app, and I say, I need a car for two hours. I rent it, it's two blocks from my place. I take it for two hours, it includes gasoline, it includes insurance, it includes everything. I just show up, take it, go shopping, come back, done, done, right? I don't need a car. Now, here's the interesting, the interesting thing about um, car sharing uh, companies like Zipcar. What they do is they take, there's a ratio of every 15 users, of Zipcar um, for one car. So they basically take 15, 14 cars off the road. Now remember that 15 to one ratio, share to own ratio, 15 to one. Um, so basically um, models like this are changing the whole concept of car ownership. I mean, if you can use a car, pay seven bucks an hour for a couple hours, why do you need to own it? Um, Ride sharing, 
Um, you may have heard of companies like Uber and Lyft. Um, what they're doing is, this is a new breed of companies that connect people, actual people. Some of you may be drivers of Uber and Lyft um, with um, basically folks who need rides. They're competing with taxis head on, right? Um, and let me give you some numbers about Uber, one of the companies. They were started in 2009. Um, now they're in 155 cities in 41 countries. As of December, they were getting a million uh, ride requests per day, a million per day, okay? They were collecting a billion dollars a year and they're doubling that every six months every six months. Now, they don't own cars. They don't own anything. This is software, okay? Um, so 2013 revenues, $200 million. Now, it gets better. They recently raised $1.2 billion uh, from uh, Google and other venture investors at a valuation of $18 billion. 18, this is a company that did not exist in 2008, okay, and does not own any cars. Um, let me compare that. Air New Zealand has a valuation of $2 billion. So there's this company, all software, um, that is worth eight times, nine times what Air New Zealand is. That is the clean disruption of transportation for you. Um, okay, so smartphones are changing everything. They're becoming the center of transportation. Uh, they're social, they're connected, it's all real time. Um, end of taxis. Taxis are gone. It's just a matter of time, depending on the market. Um, now, another set of technologies that's, that's amazing in terms of growth and in terms of how it's going to get into everything, sensors. Uh, and you may have heard of the Internet of Things. So sensors, if you own a smartphone, if you own an Android, uh, you have 12 plus sensors. It knows where you are. It knows how, do you, how you move. It, it has light sensors, voice sensors, all kinds of sensors. They're getting cheaper, smarter, uh, embedded everywhere. Everything that can be measured will be measured everywhere, all the time. Okay, here's how fast the sensor market's growing. Some types of sensors are growing by 200, 700% per year, per year. Um, and this is what it's gonna look like in 10 or 15 years. Some folks are forecasting that we may have 10, so today the market for sensors, we get 10 billion sensors a year, that's the market. By 2025, 2030, some folks expect 10 trillion sensors. Now, I want you to think about that figure. There are 7 billion people on Earth, 10 trillion sensors. That's 1,200 sensors per person per year, okay? Now, here's an example of how uh, that applies to transportation. So I mentioned that I did not have a car, but my girlfriend did, did, um, ex-girlfriend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was disrupted, yeah. Um, so the, one of the most, she had a Volvo 2000. One of the most annoying things about a car, other than the cost, is that little check engine light. When that check engine light goes on, you don't know if the car needs to be washed or it's just about to blow up, right? <laughs> but it has all the information. It's all in there, right? So this little sensor, about yay big, $99, I bought it. It tells you timeline for the, for the trip. It tells you how fast you're going. It tells you where you're going. All that information is in the black box whether you know it or not. So this sensor thingy told me all of this, all of it. And of course, it told me 
the check engine light, what it was, which was bugging me to no end, right? It only cost me a hundred bucks and I looked good doing that. Um, but, but here's how it's going to change um, a lot of things. Um, there's a startup company in San Francisco that's offering one of these uh, sensors that you can plug into your car and they can offer you insurance, car insurance by the mile. Now, think about the way that car insurance companies work today. They know your age, they know where you live, they price it. That's not a very good way to price insurance. They have no idea how you drive, unless you have an accident, right? And then it's too late. That's not very smart. Now these folks know how you accelerate, where you park, where you are, when you drive, <laughs> they know everything. So they can actually price insurance to a level that no car, com car insurance company can. So using sensors will disrupt the car insurance industry. Okay, unless they of course do it themselves. Now, vehicle to vehicle communication. Um, so basically we're talking about sensors talking to one another when you drive. Um, and uh, so you can talk to other cars, you can talk to traffic signals, school uh, signals, basically everything having to do with transportation. Um, and it can be any type of transportation, bikes, uh, motorcycles, cars, buses, trains, ferries, whatever. So everybody will be able to talk to everybody when, of course, all cars have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. Now, imagine every single car having one of these, sending information every microsecond. One, there's a lot of data, a lot of data, right? Big, big data. But also, everything is connected to everything. Every car is connected, every traffic signal is connected, every school uh, bus is connected, so that uh, we can uh, finally see traffic as a living, breathing thing. Now, imagine that if you use something like a Fitbit for your heart rate or to count uh, you know, your health, uh, you can also connect that. Um, so soon, soon, within 10 years, we're gonna have trillions of sensors in billions of devices, in a car will be a device, generating all kinds of information from humidity to your heart rate. All of that is gonna be connected to that internet of things. Um, and so, conclusion. Um, vehicles are using increasingly sensors. Everything having to do with transportation is being connected it's measuring everything about you, everything about every car at all times. Um, and this is basically the internet of things. And I'm gonna put all these things uh, together in a second. Now, the other major, major uh, disruption in transportation is gonna come from um, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. Um, so Nissan has announced that by 2020, um, they will launch a fully autonomous car worldwide. 2020, this is not, you know, 2040, 2020, that, that's six years from now. Fully autonomous means what? You can sleep in your car, basically. Not when it's parked, but you know, basically you can go to work and sleep in your car. Do Facebook, work. You can do basically anything you want. Um, now, can you play the video? Let me show you this quickly. This is Google's latest car as of May 2014. Okay, Annie, here we go. Yeah. All right, Cody, let's go. There's no, no steering, steering wheel. wheel no steering wheel. You sit, relax. You do not do nothing. It knows when you need to stop. It knows when you need to go. <laughs> it actually rides better than my own car. Yes, sure. <laughs> What she really liked was that it slowed down before it went around a curve and then accelerated in the, in curve. the curve. She's always trying to get me to do, do it that way. That's the way I learned in high school driver's ed. 
So if I had a self-driving car, I could spend more time hanging out with my kids or helping them with their homework, even just tending to them, finding out how their day was and not having to wait till you get home and have dinner and all that. So it'll be good. I love this. <laughs> this car is ready. It, it's ready. It's out there. They're, they just built a hundred of them and they're using them, uh, some of them anyway, in the uh, Google campus in, in Mountain View. And just to show you, this is what a Google car sees. This is what uh, the technology is called LIDAR, the short for um, laser and radar. Um, they can see 200 meters ahead and actually 360 degrees, uh, 200 meters. And um, so LIDAR, just to give you an indication of exponentially improving technologies, um, the one that they used, the LiDAR is the hat uh, on top of this car, was 70 grand in 2012. And the latest version is $10,000. Now, I know an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley that, who claims he's making them for $1,000. So th th this is the type of virtuous cycle that happens when a market develops. The self-driving car will not be more expensive than just a generic elec uh, uh, electric vehicle or even a gasoline car. Um, of course, with all the goodies that it has. The question is, will the public buy into these things? And uh, Cisco did a study and look at the numbers. Brazil, 95% um, of Brazilians say they will use them. They probably haven't even seen one, but they're ready for it. Right? I mean, in India, in China, I mean, most people are ready for this. Um, so in terms of acceptance uh, of the market, which is always, of course, really important, um, a lot of folks are ready. I'm ready. I can't wait. Now, here's what's interesting. Most high-end cars already have most self-driving technologies. If you drive a new high-end Mercedes or BMW or Audi or Volvo, you are already um, using a lot of these technologies, already. I mean, you, you can drive it 25, 35 miles per hour on the highway and just, as long as you keep your hand on the wheel for legal reasons, it just goes today. Now, the US Department of Transportation has this matrix from zero to four, where zero is humans are in full control and four being uh, the car, the computer, is in full control. We're already at level three, already. So we just need a little push to get us to full, full autonomy. And the Google car is nearly there. Um, so in fact, ever, uh, since that press release in September 2013, that Nissan was going to launch their autonomous vehicle in 2020, they're like, actually, things are going faster than we expected. We now expect to launch it 2018. 2018, full autonomous car. And the only reason, according to CEO Carlos Ghosn, that they would not launch it is legal, not technical, okay? Um, now, that's great self-driving cars, it's great, all that, but what does it mean? What does it mean? Here's what it means. We human beings are not great drivers, okay? You may, may not have heard that before, but we're not great drivers. Even when we're not drinking or speaking on the phone or talking to other people, um, we're not great drivers. 1.2 million people die in car accidents every year worldwide. And half of them were not even in a car. Okay, now, not only that, we waste 95% of highways, at best, because we leave so much space between the cars, behind us, on the sides, and 95% so of highways are wasted. Okay, now, um, two technologies, just two of the technologies that go into self-driving cars um, adaptive cruise control, and um, so just ACC can improve highway capacity by 40%. So think about 
all the highways that are being built right now and all the billions of dollars going into highways, if you just add this little sensor thingy, 40% more highways. Now, if you add vehicle to vehicle communication plus ACC, just two technologies, that in and of itself can improve highway capacity by 273%. Just two little technologies, okay? Now, what does that mean? Autonomous vehicles can end congestion by increasing highway capacity by at least 4X. What that means is what? 80% of highways are redundant already if all cars were self-driving. Okay, now highway, now let's talk about parking. In the US, there are 500 million to 2 billion surface uh, parking spaces. We, we only have 300 million people. And, and, and we always complain about lack of parking, right? Um, in some cities, up to a third of the surface of the city is taken up with parking spaces. In Houston, there are 30 parking spaces per person, per person. Amazing, right? And still 40% of gasoline is wasted looking for a parking spot, 40%, right? Now, cars, in fact, are our second largest capital investment. After our homes, we don't spend more money on anything but cars. And yet, we only drive them one to two hours per day. Think about that. Cars are parked 96% of the time. Think about it. Car industry has done such a great job with you people. They get you to pay 40 grand plus gasoline, plus insurance, plus all the hassle, to use it just 4% of the time. Wow, right? Now, 90% um, of the time they're parked, and free parking is very expensive. <laughs> very expensive. Taxpayers pay at least $20,000 for each free parking you know, curb or off-street parking. $20,000, maybe up to $70,000. There's no such thing as free parking. Um, but it's all gonna change. And how's it gonna change? Think about combining something like Uber with the self-driving car, where you always have a car at your two minutes away. You say, I'm here, I wanna go there, right? All we want from car ownership is what? Mobility. We want them to take us from point A to point B anytime at a reasonable cost, right? And self-driving cars, um, so far, it looks like they might be 80 to 90% cheaper on a per mile basis. So if you can go from anywhere to anywhere anytime um, at 90% less money, why would you want to own a car, which is an expensive bookend, in other words, right? So when you do this, it's gonna flip the equation. Self-driving cars don't need to park, really. They're gonna pick you up, drop you off, and pick somebody else up. Think about it. Which means that cars, instead of being 90% parked, they're gonna be 90% used. Even if it's only 80%, what that means is the world is gonna have 80% fewer cars. Does that make sense? 80% fewer cars. There's gonna be no need to own a car once you combine mobile internet and the cloud and big data and self-driving cars. So I told you that the Zipcar share to own ratio was 15 to one. Basically for every user, uh, we take uh, 14 cars off the road. Even if you do five to one, which is a more conservative number, you still take 80% cars off the roads. Done. Okay. 
80% for of parking spaces, redundant. We don't need them anymore. We don't need driveways in your homes. We don't need parking. We don't need garage, especially in the downtown area because they're going to drop you off, pick somebody else, and, and keep going. And if and when they actually need to park to recharge, they can do it somewhere else where it's cheaper for the land and so on and so forth. Um, now, an example of a city doing this, or at least announcing that they're going to do it, Helsinki, Finland, just announced that they're going to do exactly what I'm saying. The downtown area uh, is going to be knit together with driverless cars, minibuses, uh, ferry, and this and that. Basically, they're doing the infrastructure so that all of these uh, transportation options, private and public, are going to be linked via software. Basically, they're doing what I showed you, what I've been doing for seven years. Um, but they're going to do it at a city level. And they're going to make car ownership in Helsinki obsolete by 2025. That's only 11 years out. Um, OK, so conclusion. Car as a service, mobility on demand, is going to change the concept of individual car ownership. Basically, we won't need to own cars anymore. We're going to have 80% fewer cars on the road, which means the auto industry is going to be disrupted. I mean, they're going to have to make uh, only 20% of the cars that they make now. Just two companies could make all the uh, cars that we need, just two companies. Um, and of course, the car insurance industry is going to be disrupted. 80% um, of highways are going to be basically redundant, 80% of parking spaces, all of these changes by 2030. Okay, big data um, is going to be huge because all of these technologies are nothing if not data producers. Uh, the Google car generates one gigabyte per second. It could fill up your laptop in about one minute. One each car. Imagine a million of these going, you know, generating all this data, and sensors and and EVs and so all of this data is going to generate. Okay, so the number of sensor-based devices uh, is growing exponentially. The number of sensors within each device is growing exponentially. The amount of data that each one of these sensors generate is growing exponentially. See where I'm going? The number of connections between all of these is also growing exponentially. So what you get in the end is a combinatorial explosion of data about transportation. So today we make basically investments, 30, 40 year investment decisions that are going to cost you billions of dollars on the basis of very little data, very little data. Now, this big data is going to be a much better way to make decisions about transportation. Ah. OK, so let me give you an example of um, how you can use big data to make smart decisions. Uh, MIT uh, looked at uh, New York City taxi cabs uh, data for one year. And here's what they, one of the things that they found out. Um, taxis in New York make 150 million trips uh, in or out of Manhattan. 73,000 of those started at Grand Central and went to Union Square. And 94%, 94,000 went from Union Square back to Grand Central. That's one and a half miles. That's a 10 minute walk, 15 minute walk, right? So out of all that movement in Manhattan, you know, we have 160,000 trips that are going between just point A and point B, just a mile and a half down. Now, if you know that, and we had no idea before MIT did this study, and the only way they did it was with big data, um, then you can make sensible decisions about transportation, okay? Now, I just want to give you one example about what you can do, what a sensible we're here at CES trying out the Navio, which is a self-driving shuttle. It's uh, very cool. It's actually used for uh, locations such as college campuses or the military or even corporate campuses like Google or places like that. 
So right now we're on a track, we're going around, and it's going by itself. There is not a conductor or anybody driving this right now, which is great. So it follows a track, it has laser that basically looks at the markings on the sides of the road and also any pedestrians that are there. So it, the laser can sense all around the shuttle. We expect to see this in the States in the near future, so stay tuned. But it's actually a great concept and we really like the idea. It helps with mobility, getting people, a bunch of people on this tram, and it also is fuel efficient. So there you have it, self-driving vehicle, riding on uh, batteries, it's an electric car. It already works, it already works in Europe. Um, and it goes very slowly. If all you want is one and a half miles uh, back and forth between point A and point B, you can start with this instead of having 160,000 taxis going back and forth and back and forth and burning gasoline and all that, right? So, and the thing about this, you making decisions using actual data um, is that you spend 100K or whatever, 200K on, on something like this. If it works, you expand it. It doesn't work, then you shut it down. Um, it was just 200K, not a billion dollar highway. Does that make sense? So that is the beauty of making decisions with big data. Okay, so let me wrap this up um, and put all these things together. Um, and let me go back to New York. And now I started with New York City, Fifth Avenue, um, April 15th, 1900. And every time I show horses, horses are so cute. They're so romantic, right? But in fact, they were not. They were anything but. Um, has anyone heard of the horse manure crisis? Well, that was the climate uh, change of the day. Um, in 1880, New York City had 175,000 horses. That was before the peak. Um, dumping four million pounds of manure each day on New York City streets. And this helped create a massive, massive crisis in city planning. Not just New York City, by the way, every uh, large, wealthy, Western city. Um, the environment, imagine this. Uh, when it rained, all this gunk turned into a river of poop, okay? In the summer, it dried up, and when there was wind, where do you think it blew it? That's what people would breathe. Hell, three billion flies per day would hatch in this thing, causing all kinds of deadly infectious diseases, typhoid, infant diarrhea, deaths, congestion. Traffic was so bad in New York and so dangerous on a per capita basis, more people died because of traffic accidents then than do now in New York on a per capita basis. It was dangerous. And death, of course, they had to cart away 15,000 dead horses per year. This was a massive crisis. Um, and there was no way that they could solve this within the existing infrastructure, the existing organizations, the existing system. So the way things were going, I mean, look at what these folks said uh, in London and New York. They were expecting poop to go up to the third floor of every single street in London and New York. I mean, it was ugly. It was really ugly. Um, so um, city planners called the first worldwide urban planning conference. The issue of the day was the horse manure crisis. I mean, it was really, really big. Um, uh, so delegates flew from London, Sydney, and so on to New York. And, was that? A flu, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, took a three-month ship. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, I didn't think of that disruption. Um, so after three days, the 10-day conference was broken up, and they were sent home because there were no new ideas. And in fact, if you think about what we're facing today, there are no new ideas. We can't solve the gasoline car crisis within the existing system. Cities have tried congestion pricing and cities have tried 
preventing parking and proceeding. So it, it, it's, it is not gonna work within the existing system. And that's what they faced those days. Now, what did solve this was not clean poop, was not manure capture and storage. <laughs> I mean, think about what the energy industry is selling you today as solutions to the energy crisis. Um, it was not fracking manure <laughs> or biofuel poop. None of that stuff. I'm sure they tried it. And I'm sure some people denied that there was a horse manure crisis. <laughs> what horse manure crisis? What are you smoking, poop? <laughs> and by the way, it wasn't solved by a government, you know, target of 30% less poop in 20 years. No, that didn't solve it either. What did solve it was two technology disruptions. One, the automobile. The automobile was an environmental technology at the time, but that's not why it won. It won because it was a disruptive technology. And two, the electric streetcar. That combination of public and private transportation, two different disruptive technologies um, solved the horse manure crisis. And it took less than 15 years. We went from all horse to all car and electric uh, streetcar. So, you know, the technologies, the organizations, the culture of the industrial revolution, which is what we've had to endure for 100 years plus, um, are, you know, already run out of steam. Um, they will be replaced by the technologies and the organizations and the innovation and the people that are going to create these technologies, the electric vehicles, the self-driving car, big data, mobile internet, and so on. We're going to see more changes over the next 10 to 15 years than we have seen in a hundred years. Um, it's transportation is going to radically change. Um, you know, 80% less parking, highways, 80% fewer cars. Um, and in doing this, basically it's going to open up so much more room for us to have parks, not parking, to have green, to have more density, to have more businesses. And all of this is going to make our cities more livable, cleaner, healthier, and wealthier. Um, and the cities that lead this disruption, the clean disruption, are going to lead the 21st century. And this is not in the future, this is now. It's already happening. Thank you. Thank you.